because what I have there, I felt was what I needed to do. I usually try and change from conference to conference. But after I got home last night and I sat down and I started doing my final review, I really couldn't find any peace. I went through it and I got in bed and my husband says, I thought you were gonna, and I said, well, I did, but I just, I don't know, I'll have to get up in the morning and see. So I got up early this morning and got my kids here and went back home. And I started to pray and I said, Lord, you know, I need to rerun this one more time. And he said, oh, I know. And I said, well, um, it, you know, is there something you need to say? And he says, yeah, thanks for asking. <laughs> and I said, why might that be? And he said, I really don't want them taught. And I said, you don't? And I thought that's what we were doing here. And he said, no, I want him touched. And I said, I guess that means we're changing. And he said, yes. So while we will get to some of what's there maybe, I have to do a little bit of a detour. Still all relative to deliverance, still in the manual, just different topic, okay? So you'll just have to run with me. For those of you who may or may not know, there is a deliverance manual that the church has. While you may be reluctant to spend $12 to buy it, I, I just want you to know that it'll be probably the most well-invested $12 you've ever spent, and I'm gonna tell you why. There's not many people that can come in and say, you can buy this because it's multifaceted, but I can do that. Because I have learned, especially over the past year and a half, that this manual is multifaceted. I used to just use it when I ministered to people, but about nearly two years ago, God changed things. And he got to where he was sending me to places to tear down strongholds in places. And I thought, well, that's interesting. And you know what I was using? Because just like we teach in deliverance, you know, you'll know things by the fruit. See, in deliverance, that's good and bad. When you see a certain stronghold in here and you see what's listed underneath it, that's identifies. That's how you identify what's working in someone's life. We see you can look in your city and you can take those same strongholds and you can see the fruit of what's operating in your city. And then if you really want to rely on God, which is what I have to do, you can let him take you to where you need to go to do warfare. And you can use this to do your warfare. That's what he does with me. I'll go into a city, have absolutely no idea where I'm going, and he will say, I'll take you there. And so I just start driving and pretty soon Power God hits and you know you're where you need to be. And he will tell you what you need to do. That's called relying on the Holy Spirit. Yes, we have this manual and it gives us order and it helps us keep things to where we need to be, but it also we have to still be listening to what the Holy Spirit says. So I just kind of wanted to throw that in for those of you that are kind of wondering whether you need to buy a manual or not. It'll be worth your money because you can use that to do other things. I promise you. And I don't get a thing off of that, so that's free. I'm a volunteer at this church. Anything I do is a volunteer status. I'm going to go ahead. seems like about everybody's in, so we're going to get started on the meat of what we came here to learn or to be touched by. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to pray first. Father, in Jesus' name, I know, Lord, that you have brought each person here that you intended to be here. And, Father, I don't want this to just be another meeting. We've had enough of that. Father, I want this to be something where these people leave and they have something in their hand and in their heart that they can say, not only can I be changed, but I can help to change the life of someone else. And, Father, I'm asking in the name of Jesus that you touch ears and you touch eyes and you touch hearts. Let them have ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts that will be open and obedient to whatever you have to say. 
And Father, above all, we give you the praise and glory because you're what it's all about anyhow. It doesn't have anything to do with us. And I thank you, Father, for bringing just those people here that you needed to have here today. In Jesus' name. The first thing I'm going to touch on is the difference between someone that's demon-possessed and someone that just has a stronghold in their life. If I could say, what is the most asked question? It would be, can Christians be demon-possessed? I, I tell you, I hear that more times than I care to talk about. But I want you to understand where I'm coming from. I've been involved in this ministry since the late 70s, and I don't think I've ever met a Christian that was demonized. Now, I have ministered to some people with some strong stuff, but there is a grand difference in ministering to someone that is demon-possessed and someone that just has some stuff in their life that needs to be dealt with. When you have someone that is demon-possessed, trust me, there won't be any question. You'll know that immediately. It's not hard to recognize. They're usually snarling, snapping, biting, growling, kicking, biting, the whole nine yards. And when you have someone like that, the best piece of advice I can give you is to get four or five of your most godly friends, get the word, and go to work, because that's all you're going to need. Name of Jesus, blood of Jesus, word of God, that's the only thing that a demon's going to bow his knee to. It's not going to have a thing to do with what you have to say, nor does it have anything to do with the tone of your voice. I go out all over the United States to do workshops teaching on deliverance, and I'm forever having people say, you have such a little voice. I, I'm not sure what they were expecting. But I mean, I can get loud if I need to get loud, but see, the tone of your voice has very little to do with what you have to do. So that's my advice to you. If you have somebody that's demon-possessed, you better get big friends, too, because nine times out of ten, you're going to have to hold those people down because they're not going to want to be in your presence. And it's not your presence. It's the God in you. But you know what I'm saying. They're not going to want to be in the room with you. When you're talking about someone that has a stronghold, and I always have people say, why in the world's a stronghold? Well, it's just what it says it is. It's just that the oppression has a strong hold. It's not that a stronghold is something. It just means that there's a strong hold there of the oppression. At the time that you're saved, your spirit's redeemed. We're made up of spirit, soul, and body. Somebody that is demon-possessed is possessed spirit, soul, and body. Well, when you get saved, your spirit's redeemed. It's bought by the blood, and I promise you that there's not a demon that I know of that's going to cross the bloodline. No way, no how. Of course, unless you ask it to, and then it may, because you have willed that to happen, and then you'd have to question your Christianity. The soul is made up of the mind, will, and emotions. Where are all of our problems? Mind, will, and emotions in the soulish realm. And that's where the strongholds are established, is in the soulish realm. And this is always the big deal. Always the big deal. Well, does that mean I'm possessed? No, because your spirit's redeemed. However, you can be oppressed in the soulish realm. How are strongholds established? I'm going to give you three ways that a stronghold is established. One is through lineage. Exodus 20, verse 5, talks about the sins of the forefathers going down into the third, fourth generation. We've all heard that. If you think that doesn't exist, you better think again because it does. Sit back and look at your own family heritage. You can see things like alcoholism, or you can see things like mental illness. You can see things like lying. You can see things like... Um, anger, jealousy, those types of things that just keep coming down. Sexual sin, divorce, fornication, kids born out of wedlock. I mean, it all just keeps coming and coming. Now, you may choose not to have that happen in your life. That's your choice. 
That doesn't mean it's not still hanging around. And this stuff can skip a generation and then hit the next one. And when it does, it's much stronger when it comes on. Another way is through crisis. Sometimes we just have doors open, and this is what we call this, is doors being opened in our life through crisis. If you're sexually molested when you're five years old, did, did you open a door to anything? No, but somebody else made that choice for you. That's a crisis in your life. And so doors to several different areas are opened. And a stronghold can be established through physical, sexual, verbal abuse. The last one is through choices. Joshua 24, 15 says, Choose you this day whom you will serve. How many of you know some days we make lousy choices? I mean, we can make some lousy choices. And we have consequences to those choices that we have to deal with. And so these are ways that we get doors that are open in our lives that oppression can operate in through the soulish realm. Ephesians 4.27 in the Amplified says, Leave no room or foothold for the devil. Give him no opportunity. So you can't afford to give him any opportunity. And for many years, many of us have had doors swinging open, and we wonder why we can't get anywhere with God. We're not making bad choices. We're not living in sin. We're not doing wrong things. It's just that because of things that happened to us, maybe when we were children, or maybe in our teen years that we haven't gotten past, those doors are still open. It's time to get them shut. Oppression. What is oppression? What in the world is oppression? It isn't anything except weightiness weighing down upon. So you get oppression or pressure pushing down on the soulish realm. When we get into a deliverance setting or tearing down of strongholds, when we tear this stuff down, it usually leaves through a body opening, which means that the person, and this is ministry, by the way, they're just sitting in a chair and you're there and you're just tearing this stuff down. You're not holding anybody down. There's, you know, nothing like that going on. It's just purely ministry and you're tearing this stuff down and when you do it has to release because it is on its pressure on the soulish realm so it leaves through a body opening through a yawn burp cough sneeze cry laugh and again i have people say well you're talking somebody's possessed there no i am not i'm talking about oppression lifting off the soulish realm through doors that have been opened in someone's life. So I want to put that to rest. I am not standing here saying Christians can be demonized. They cannot. I've never dealt with one. And I can guarantee you we have over 500 sessions a year in this church, and most of which I get involved in, and I've been doing this for four years, and I did this for a number of years back in the 70s before I came here. I have never seen a Christian demonized. But I want you to write this down because this is important. The degree to which you have been involved in something will dictate how strong the hole is. Now I have seen some big stuff because people were deeply involved in things, but when I call it demonic, no. Because I know the difference. And once you deal in those areas, you will know the difference as well. One of the biggest issues with deliverance, and I believe one of the reasons that people aren't instantaneously delivered is, is unforgiveness. See, we have to get ourselves in a place to where we're in alignment with God's word. If we're coming to the Father and asking him to give us something, to set us free of something, to tear something down in our lives, we have to be in agreement with his word. And a lot of times we're not. We hold bitternesses resentments, unforgivenesses towards people for whatever reason. And sometimes you may feel totally justified. However, we still have to get ourselves into alignment with God's word. And so 
in this manual, I mean, there's so many scriptures in there. If I went through every scriptural reference that we need to today, we would be here for a week. When I go out, I have eight hours worth of teaching. You can tell in one hour, we're not going to get real far. So, you know, there are scriptures there. I can't, I don't have time to go through all of them. Matthew 18, 23 through 35 basically says, if you don't forgive, God's not going to forgive. And there's just flat, not going to be any deliverance. So that's the one thing that in my pre-deliverance counseling sessions I have to stress. The biggest, biggest, biggest issue today is sexual abuse. It used to be, years ago, if I heard one or two people every three or four months that had been sexually abused, not that way anymore. It's every other person. 90% of the people I minister to are abuse victims. And I'm telling you that they haven't been abused by strangers. They've been abused by family members, stepmothers, stepfathers, stepbrothers, stepsisters, uncles, cousins, you name it. That's where the molestation is. It is the number one biggest issue with people that we deal with. And it's not just people sitting on the back pews. I deal with a lot of pastors' wives. I deal with a lot of pastors that have been abused. Maybe not sexually, maybe physically, maybe verbally. Very, very big issues. The forgiveness is the answer. That's where it begins for them. I always tell my abuse victims, you must confront who abused you. If you don't know who it is, then I always have them write a letter. See, a lot of times we think with forgiveness, I have to do this. So I'm going to do it, and it's right here. This is where our forgiveness is. It's in the head. It's not in the heart. So basically, we haven't forgiven at all. If you can get people to that place where they can forgive, deliverance will be easy. And that's the reason why we don't get more deliverance over in the sanctuary, is because people just won't forgive. Like I told some of you when we first came in, your syllabus is going to get changed a tad. I felt like I needed to go a little bit of a different route, so I'm going to do that. After being here last night, and then uh, they were short of prayer team people, so we went down and prayed for a little bit. And I never felt so much pain in all my life. That's one of the benefits of working in the spirit realm. You can feel things. And so I said, well, that's what God meant when he said, I don't want you to teach him. I want you to touch him. So I'm going to share with you some te today some things that have ha happened with me personally. I don't like to do that. But I can tell you, and I can feel it right now, there are some people in here that need to hear this. So that's why I'm going to go where I'm going. I've never gone here before in a public-type setting. So you'll just have to kind of bear with what's going on today. I want to talk to you a little bit about bondages. Remember when I said a while ago, the fruit or the manifestations? When I talk about the tree of bondage, what grows on that is things like fears, addictions to drugs, alcohol, cigarettes, food, sex, whatever it is that you're doing that you can't quit, trust me, is a bondage. Lust, captivity to Satan, bound, compulsive sin, bondage to sin, servant of corruption, ambition, fear, oppression, bitterness. Those are all things that are bondages. And I deal with a lot of people that are in control. They're in bondage to control. Lots of people. And I'm telling you, the word of God, what's, what's the word say? control is witchcraft so you can see we all have a lot of work and God is still working I'm telling you 
I want to talk to you a little bit about addictions and how things can happen to us that we don't even know and how it will affect our lives. When I was growing up, my father was an alcoholic. And I don't need to go to that place because if you've ever been in that situation, you know that that is just not a good place to be. It's especially not a good place to be if you are the object of your parents' anger and frustration. And that was such the case for me. When I was little, it always seemed to be that whatever went wrong ended up being my fault. So I took a lot of abuse, a lot of physical abuse. The last time that I remember my father taking a belt to me, I was 19 years old. And he used that belt buckle inside, just blood whelps everywhere. And that was the day I decided it would stop. And the big issue for me later on in life, see, I, I forgave my dad. That was easy. But I couldn't understand why there was still so much pain and why there was so, still so much hurt and still some bitterness. And it took me until about 12 years ago to realize that while I forgave my father, what about my feelings towards my mother for allowing that to happen? I had no idea that was there. And so I had to deal with that, and it was very painful, very painful. But through just a series of things, I was able to deal with those issues. Been through deliverance several times. First time way back in the 70s. Always had a lot of rejection, a lot of self, you know, low self-esteem. All of the things that come with coming out of a uh, home where you know there wasn't proper nurture, proper bonding, uh, those types of things. Failure of authority figures in your life, those type of things. When I got to be about 20-something years old, there was no one in my family, by the way, that went to church. I was the only one. I started going to church when I was six years old. My grandparents were Christians, and my grandfather used to take me to church until we moved from where they lived. And so no matter where we lived, and my father was in the service, so I traveled different places, I always found a church. Usually had to walk there. I can remember 11 years old, walking a mile and a half to a church in South Florida every Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night by myself. Now that scares me to think about it now. But at the time, God was, he was protecting me. My mother finally got saved when I was about 15 years old. Getting back to the, to the story, after I went to my mother and I forgave her, it changed a lot in my life. Again, back in the 70s, when I went through deliverance, most of that deliverance was for fear, and hurt, rejection, those types of things. The one thing I didn't realize that was there was death. And just by some chance, one of the ladies happened to mention death, and all of a sudden my body went rigid and I slid right out of the chair. And I thought, well, I wonder what this is. And so they just persisted, and really it was like my foot was asleep, you know, just kind of numb, tingly. And all of a sudden, they persisted, and I felt, I felt this lift. And I said, well, that, that was good. And afterwards, these ladies told me, they said, where in the world would you get such death? And I said, well, I was born about a month premature, only weighed five pounds, and the cord was wrapped around my neck. So apparently, the enemy had some plans that we weren't aware of. But sovereignly... God spared me, and I'm here today. But we had no idea that death could have been anywhere, and it was very much there. This lady said to me, when she asked me to go through deliverance, she said, Teresa, you know, I see so much potential, but you're just so negative and so down, and so where did all this stuff come from? You know, people don't usually talk about their past a lot, and I said, well, just some stuff, you know, growing up. 
And she said, well, you need deliverance. Wrong thing to say to me. I mean, I'm a Christian. What do you mean deliverance? Is there something I don't know about? Because much like today, 30 years ago, if you said deliverance, it meant the D word. There were demons somewhere. Now, I had never been involved in alcohol, drugs, no sexual sin, no nothing. I was spared all of that. So the thought that there could be a demon in me was really strange. And she said, no, 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 you don't understand. That's not what I'm talking about. This is just getting rid of some of this stuff that's there just because of things that happen to you. And so when I went through deliverance, I want you to know that it changed my life. I was no longer that person. I was able to pull myself up and to get to places I never thought I'd be, especially spiritual places, because there was no longer that wall that was pushing me back. As time went on, I got married. I married a Navy pilot, and I married late in life, late to some people. And I'm not going to say how late, but it was later than most. <laughs> the first time my husband left for a deployment, I was not really wanting him to go. We had only been married two and a half years, and I just didn't, I was in a strange town, strange place. I had a six weeks old baby, and he was going to be gone for seven months. So he left. And when he came back, I mean, what do you do when you're by yourself for six months? I'll tell you what I did. I put my baby in the stroller during the day, and I'd go to the mall. And I'd be going around the mall, just looking. I know you're going to think, well, she's looking for shoes and clothes and all that stuff. No. Didn't get in trouble there. I'd go through the housewares department. And you know, they always got those demonstrations going. And so I'm sitting there and I'd go, gosh, look at that. And I'm, and I'm a house type person. I like to cook and all that kind of stuff. So when I'd leave the mall, whatever they were demonstrating, I had under my arm. And so a week later, back to the mall, there I go through the housewares department. And they're doing another demonstration. Now, how many of you know after six months, <laughs> you can take many trips to the mall, and you can see many demonstrations. <laughs> and my husband came home. I'm going somewhere with this, folks. I am. And when he came in, and you know, we got our welcome over with and so forth, he walked into the kitchen and he said, come here. <laughs> and so I did. And he said, what in the world is all of this? And I said, all of what? And he said, all this. Okay, now I'm borderline and picking up an offense here. Because after all, these were my friends. <laughs> At nighttime, who has comforted me? It has, you know, I baked, chopped, diced, sliced, <laughs> processed, reprocessed, overprocessed. I did it all. And he says to me, I don't get it. What is this? I tell him. And he'd say, well, what is this? Isn't this the same as that? <laughs> no, that's the deluxe model. <laughs> and so after we got through this little deal, you know, he kind of calmed down. And I thought, boy, I'm glad that's over with. I mean, after all. All I did was 
stay here night after night and play and cook for my girlfriends and all this. And, you know, he, that's kind of, I really thought it was kind of rough for him to come in and get on my case about that. So I was glad he calmed down about it. And about four days later, I heard, come here. And I thought, now what? And so I went in, and he's sitting in there with all the credit card bills out. <laughs> and he said, what is all of this? And I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, Teresa, this is not something we need. And I said, yeah, you weren't here alone for six months. You didn't need it, but I did. And he, so we went through this deal, and then finally he said, there, there's a problem here. And it's something we're going to have to deal with. And I'm thinking, well, I went through deliverance 10 years ago. What, what do you mean problem? And the place that I'm trying to get to is, if you have history of alcoholism in your family or drug abuse, whatever, just because you choose not to get involved with that kind of activity doesn't mean that that addictive, compulsive behavior isn't going to be there. Now, it took a while to show up, but it showed up. And much like my father struggled with alcohol, I was going to go through a struggle myself. And so my husband took all my credit cards away just because he thought that was the thing to do. And so me being the obedient person that I am, I gave them to him. And for the next year, I have to tell you, I went through a struggle because, see, I still went to the mall. And I still went through the housewares department. And much like an alcoholic would struggle reaching for that drink, did I not struggle to buy that new gadget? And sometimes I had failures. How many of you know women always have mad money? We always have a little mad money tucked away. So I would have times when I would fall, and I would have times when I would over overcome and as I began to do more warfare and more warfare and more warfare and begin to say no even when I would go in there and I could feel that pull to go to the housewares department I would say no I'm not going there because I can't afford to go there not finan financially but spiritually and physically and emotionally, I can't afford to go there. And so I had to do a lot of warfare to keep myself from going to that place where I knew I didn't need to go because the temptation was going to be far too great. And so I had to overcome that. And I did, and it was a struggle. That was many years ago. And all of those gadgets are still sitting in my garage. Someday I'm going to have the world's biggest garage sale. But until then, I keep a lot of them there as reminders of how ridiculous that was. Because, see, now I can see. Before, I couldn't see. And now you go out and you look and you go, Oh, dear Jesus, did I really need to do that? And I didn't, but it felt, it filled a need and a void within me much as it does an alcoholic or someone that is on drugs that is trying to quit. And really all we're trying to do is satisfy a need that is so deep down within us. And I wish I could say that was the end of the story, but it wasn't. Because, see, when you go through traumatic times like that as a child and you go through one hurdle and another and another, God is always perfecting. He's always healing. He's always changing, as long as we allow him to. Not long after revival started, and I, you know, I took myself through deliverance again because I wanted to make sure every area was clear, you know,
cleaned up. There wasn't anything anywhere. But I noticed that every time I would go for prayer, every time the pastor, whoever was praying for me, they'd reach that quick hand at me. Well, you know what happens when a quick hand comes to someone that's been abused. You get one of these numbers. And I would catch myself doing that, and I would say, Dear God, why am I doing that? Why am I doing that? And every time, didn't matter who it was, and I'd go up, and, and it'd be pastor, and he's going to pray for me, and immediately I'd, and I thought, I bet he wonders, what is her problem? But you see, you can go through many aspects of healing. Someone that has been through a lot of abuse, whether it's sexual abuse, verbal abuse, physical abuse, there gets to be what we call damaged emotions. And see, damaged emotions is not a deliverance issue. You can deal in the areas that house the emotions, such as fear, heaviness, those types of things, but to do deliverance on somebody's emotions and get them to line up, you're not going to do that. But God can heal damaged emotions if you allow him to. And so I continued on through this process, and I wish I could tell you how long it went on, but I don't know. I just know that one night I went down to get prayer, and guess what? I didn't do that anymore. God had healed whatever that was inside, that place. He had healed that. But then I started doing something else. Now, and this hasn't stopped yet, when I get prayer, when the power hits, I, 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 it's not a scream, I just kind of yip. <laughs> and I thought, what in the world is that? But I know... That because, see, we all know that there are places, you know, you sit there and, and you know, you know when there's that place in you. And I know that there's still yet that place that God is working on. And if I continue to allow him, then that will, too, be healed. Because, see, we have to come into wholeness. That's all part of holiness, is being whole. Not just spiritually, but sometimes emotionally. And that is the place where I'm still headed. I'm not there yet. But bless God, I'm still moving in that direction. And I'm not exactly sure why I shared all of that, because I, I don't usually talk about those types of things. For one thing, it puts me in a very vulnerable position. But for another thing... It exposes areas in my life that, you know, you, you don't really want people to know about. But I want you to know I did that because there is somebody in here, and I don't think it's one. I think it's several that needed to hear that. Because you needed to know that there was hope. You needed to know that there was help. And you needed to know that God was still moving. Because some of you have cried out from places so deep down inside within yourself for God to move, and you're still waiting, and you're still wondering. But I'm here to tell you that that's what God is about. And he will touch you if you continue to press in and press in and press in. I know he will. I have taken far too long here than I needed to take on that. Bondages are a big issue for a lot of people. But I want you to know that there is hope and there is help. And you can be free, even from things like control. It may take several sessions to get that broken down because a lot of times our control issues are we're trying to keep ourselves in control because of issues in our lives and we don't want them exposed so we keep ourselves under such tight control. But God can deal with that as he heals all of those places. 
When we're finished ministering in that area of bondage, we're going to put something in the foundation, and that's going to be the spirit of adoption and liberty, according to Romans 8.15. Every time you take something out, you pull it down that stronghold, you've got to put something in. We're going to put the word back in that place. Do I have any Vietnam veterans in here today? Yeah, anybody that was in Vietnam? Okay, I'm going to give you some information, and you guys are going to receive something today. This is in the area of divination. This is going to be information that you can use, you can take out, and you can minister to other, other people. When you're talking about divination, you're talking about things like fortune telling, soothsaying, witches, warlock and sorcery, stargazers, zodiac, horoscopes, rebellion, hypnosis, enchanter, drugs, illegal or prescription, Ouija boards, tarot cards, handwriting analysis, stubborn, manipulation, magic, white or black, Wicca, water witching, any of those things that would be called divination. In this particular stronghold, there is an aspect of it that I want to deal with. I'm not going to touch any of the rest of them. If you need to know what stargazing is, you can look it up in the dictionary. It's not hard to find out. I want to talk to you about Vietnam veterans. I'm going to read you some, t some statistics. These are not my statistics. This comes from a ministry called Point Man Ministries. They're out of Sheridan, Michigan, I believe it is. There are over 100,000 in prison today and over 200 on parole. In Washington State alone, there are over 4,000 living in wilderness, isolated conditions reminiscent of Vietnam. 80 to 90 percent of Vietnam veterans have been divorced, which is double the national average. And if you don't believe that the sins of the Father or which travel by way of familiar spirits mean anything, I want you to listen to this. In a recent survey of runaway street kids in Seattle, Washington, 87 out of 100 were children of Vietnam veterans. Vietnam was America's longest war. You see, while our men were in Vietnam fighting, there was a sect of Buddhist monks that were there that were placing curses on our men. Every day they would ramble these curses on our men. Now, if you were a Christian or you had parents that were Christian that were praying for you, these curses may not mean anything to you. But there were certainly a lot of people there that had no one praying for them. They weren't Christian, and I guarantee you it means something for them. We've ministered not only to people from Vietnam that have had these things in their lives, but I've dealt with people that were never in Vietnam, but dealt with the soldiers as they came back, doing paperwork, taking them back in, that these things applied to. So I want you to just listen for a minute and learn just a little bit about Vietnam. The three curses that these Buddhist monks placed on our people over there were that the American soldiers would become wandering men for the rest of their lives. Have they not? Number two, that they would never find peace. Most have not. The last one, that they would be angry men and women for the rest of their lives, which most are. And I'm going to touch on that aspect. Over this area of Asia, the demon god over that area is divination. And it was a particular demon god. It was called Chodai, C-A-O-D-A-I. That was the major demonic power over that area. And, of course, we had the Tet Offensives, which was all their pagan holidays and so forth that all of our men mostly participated in because they were in that country, in that area. And, of course, you had the troops of prostitutes that followed along. It was basically sex on demand, usually involved drugs, alcohol, 
There were exchanges of anger, hatred, revenge, rape, repressed murder, despair, homesickness, no doubt many of the problems that surfaced in the marriages after they came home came out of that. So you can see that this is a very big area, very big area of ministry. The big issue for the Vietnam veteran is in unforgiveness. And I'm going to explain that just a little bit. You see, for us, our unforgiveness is usually right around us. It's real close in our little circle. But see, for these people, it was not. You've seen footage of World War II when men would come back, and they were welcomed as heroes. There were ticker tape parades, and you know they got off the planes and the trains and the whatever, and they were welcomed home, and you know everybody would hug them, shake their hands, whatever. How many of you have seen footage of Vietnam veterans coming home? These men were spit on, they were cursed, they were denied jobs. Did they ask to go there? No. They were told to go there. And yet they went to a country, and the people in that country didn't even want them there. Talk about being confused about what you're supposed to do. And so then they come back home, they're given no ticker tape parade, no welcome. And over the years, they've been denied many, many things. And so you can see where the anger just builds up more, the frustration, the unforgiveness. And so the issues for the Vietnam veteran are in the area of unforgiveness, but they're in the area of forgiving a country, a nation, a president, movie stars, employers, relatives. Tremendous area. Tremendous area. And it's very difficult to deal with them in that area. Not impossible. Just difficult. And the reason they don't get that help is because we don't know how to give it to them. We've, we've never... If you were in Vietnam, I want you to stand up because I'm going to do something right now. Sir, I want you to stand up. I feel a Holy Ghost on this one. I want each one of you men, I want you to look up here. Sir, I want you to look up here. I want you to look at me. On behalf of our country, I want to say thank you. gone with you and we chickened out and I want to say sorry on behalf of our nation. Excuse me, I'm, I'm British. I come from a, a family of people who have all served in the British Armed Services. I want to say to the Vietnam veterans, on behalf of my country, I'm sorry. We should have gone with you. You fought communism alone and we let you down. People from Australia and New Zealand went, but we didn't. And from the bottom of my heart, as, a, as an English patriot, I want to say sorry. And we, fit, we ask, for, on behalf of my country, I ask for your forgiveness. And I want to just say, I thank you for the support you gave us in the Falklands War. We couldn't have done that without you. And I want to thank you for the support you're giving us to, to us now, fighting a war in Europe to keep Europe free. And I want to thank you. In addition to that, I want to tell you not only thank you for going, but I want to tell you that you did the right thing. We are proud of you. We love you. We honor you for what you did. And I want you to know, if you can find a way to forgive us, to forgive our nation, to forgive our president, 
God will heal you. And I feel like today the process has started. And I want you to know, sir, God is going to touch you if you let him. Are we supposed to end at 115, Robert? Is that okay? I don't want to get in trouble here. <laughs> God is on the move, and he's using deliverance in a much deeper way. I know that I kind of rambled and scattered today. I don't usually do that. If you've ever been in here before, you know that's not usually what I do. But I felt so... Um, tugged in my heart that God wanted to do something different from what I wanted to do. So I had to follow that. And after all, that's why we're here. That is why we're here. And I'm here to tell you that God has a plan for your life. He wants to touch you. And for some of you, this is what you need to hear. If not here, when? Where? And if not now, when? If you're not going to let him do it here, where are you going to let him do it? If you're not going to let him do it now, when? Isn't it time that we get over it? Isn't it time to get over it? See, God can't use you like he wants to use you until you get over the stuff. And I'm not saying you're not justified, and I'm not saying it'll be easy, but I am saying you're going to have to do it. If you want God to use you to your full potential. And many of you are hitting the same old brick wall. You just keep hitting that same old brick wall. You want to press in, you know God's got more. And you know you can get to more. But you keep hitting that same wall. Same wall. And what he's trying to say is I'm trying to require something of you. I'm trying to get you to get yourself lined up enough with my word here so I can move you into a deeper level. We've all got hidden and secret sin we think nobody knows about. I'm kind of like Steve. You've always got three witnesses, Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, so <laughs> your secret sin is not secret. He knows. And what he's trying to say is, when are you going to give it up? I deal with a lot of pastors. I know what's in their lives. See, when you can clean a pastor up, you can clean a church up. I have never seen so much pornography in the men of God. It's no wonder they can't hear from God. Their mind is cluttered with trash. And you say, how does that happen? You take a 10, 11-year-old child that finds a book or a magazine, innocently begins to look, but see what goes in through the eye gate? When you look at pornography because of the different chemical exchanges in the body, all of a sudden things begin to be burnt indelibly on the mind. That's why you've prayed for 30 years for the pictures to go away and they've never gone away. So you didn't know when you were 11, 12, 13, God was going to call you to be a pastor. And then he did. You answered the call. And now you've been struggling for 15 years with the same problem. And you got nowhere to go. Where can you go? You've been asking God for 30 years. Hadn't happened yet. But I'm telling you that the next two days that you're here, if you're struggling with pornography... You find me on the platform, and myself or one of the people that work with me, we will pray for you, and we pray that God will tear that pornography out of your mind so you can move on with God. But you've got to be willing to let your pride down enough to say, hey, I need help. I, I haven't been able to do it on my own. I've tried, but it hadn't happened. So isn't it time to get rid of the pride along with everything else? See, for many of us, God's just waiting for you to take the step and say, okay, I'm ready to admit there's some things. That's all, he's, that's all he wants. 
But some of us are so prideful, we won't even admit that we have problems. And our spouses have been telling us for years. And we think they're just rumbling. Maybe you should take that to your prayer closet and see if maybe there's some truth in it. See, God is coming back, and he's coming back soon, folks, real soon. And he's trying to get together a bride without spot or wrinkle. And we got so many spots and so many wrinkles. And it's time to let the oil come down and heal all of that stuff. Get rid of all of the stuff. The anger, the frustration. Some of you have such frustration over your churches because you have boards and board members that are, that are controlled by Jezebel spirits. And they, you know, you get so much pressure from that. Isn't it time to take control back? I don't know why I'm going there. Dear Jesus. <laughs> When I minister to a lot of pastors, that is exactly what I come across. They are so oppressed and so pushed down because they've got so many people in the church telling them what they can do and they can't do. Excuse me, who's supposed to be hearing from God? Isn't it time that you stand up and take your rightful place and get things back in order? Just because someone's wealthy doesn't mean they're hearing from God. And that's where, that's where our boards are full. And, and I'm not against boards. My, my husband's on the board here, so I'm not against boards. I'm just saying, a pastor is supposed to be the one that's hearing from God, bringing the decisions before the board and letting them decide. Somewhere along the line, we got that backwards. And so we have a bunch of people that are making decisions and God's not moving in our churches. We have a lot of people that have been in churches for years and years and years. I guess I'm going to go there. I wasn't, but I am. Since, since we have time, if you do not have a copy of Rick Godwin's book called uh, Witchcraft in the Church, you need to buy a copy. Every pastor needs to have a copy of that and he needs to read it. I don't have time to go into everything that consumes Jezebel's spirit, but I'm going to touch on a few things here since I have time, and I know I'm scattered. I didn't know I'd have time to do this. See, a lot of our churches are just plum dead, and they're dead because there's been Jezebel's spirit in the church for years. How does the Jezebel spirit get in a church? Well, I'm going to tell you how it gets in a church. And trust me, I've been in a lot of them. Go to church on Sunday morning and, and you're visiting a new church and you walk in the door back there and somebody greets you and they shake your hand. Did you know my grandfather donated the, church, the land this church sits on? Well, see, my response to that is, and... But see, for a lot of us, that's the way it is. That's the way it is. And you get these people that have been in a church for years and years, and their families have been there, and because they did certain things or they gave land, and, and somehow they've forgotten what the word gave means. <laughs> you know, they gave it, but they got the string attached to it that says, I still got some pull here. And see, that's got to stop. It's got to stop. Because as long as that's going on, you're not hearing from God. There's too much influence from everybody else. It has to stop. You may lose them. Better for you, better for them. Because they need to go somewhere else where they can receive without having influence. You walk into some churches. We don't do this much anymore, and I'm thankful to God for it, but you know, they used to put the little name tags on the side of the pew. God forbid you should go visit a church and sit in one of those pews. 
You know what I'm saying? I done that. And and so you're sitting there waiting for service and somebody comes up and you know, and it's like what's the deal? You know, and then that they're bold. You're in my seat. Oh, I thought this was a church. <laughs> but see, somehow we think that we have some right, some place, and we don't. And if this is allowed to go on and on and on and on, it, all it is is it's control, it's manipulation, it's ownership, it's people calling shots that have no authority to do that but we let them get away with it for whatever reason. Well, their grandparents were here for years and years, or their mother was here for 30 years, or so. So, sometimes change is good. It's good for everybody. And sometimes it's time to move on for everybody. And you have to go in and you have to begin to take back what the enemy has illegally stolen. And the one thing you have to understand about deliverance is it's not people, it's not faces. You have to take that out. These, these are spiritual things. It may be using a particular family to get what it wants, but it's not those people. So we don't want to begin to you know, throw people here and there because of whatever. But you can let them know that things stop. You know, you, you know, you may have donated the chandelier in the front hallway, but stop telling everybody about it because it doesn't mean anything. You know, do you come here every Sunday morning to hear from God or talk about the chandelier? And see, for many of us, it's gone on and on and on and on, and we wonder why God hasn't come in. And then we get into the place to where some of us have churches where you've got these little cliques going. I, I tell you, if I'm not tarred and feathered after this. <laughs> and I know because I have been there, trust me, we got this little group, and they always sit over here. And they're calling the shots with whatever's going on. They have so much power and so much control. If they don't like the pastor, he's history. And if they don't like what he's saying, he's history. If they don't like you when you come in, you're history. And you see, what we've done is we've brought so much of the world into the church. We think that this is our social club. This is our country club. This is where we come to socialize and see our nice, clean, tidy friends who are on the same social level as us, and financial, I might add. And you let some prostitute walk in, and all of a sudden it's like, don't tell me they're coming in here. See, we forgot that the church is a hospital where people are supposed to come to get help. And so what we end up with is we have a form of godliness, but the power ain't nowhere. And if we're not real careful, see, in places like that, let me tell you what happens. The Holy Spirit, after a while, says. And the sad thing is, is they don't even know he's gone. And if you're not careful, there's going to be a sign in the front that says Ichabod, and you're not going to get anywhere with God. And I see this all the time. I see error creeping into the church. And do you know why I see error creeping into the church? Because half the people in it don't have the first clue about what the Word of God says about anything. They're always looking to their neighbor over here to see if their neighbor is agreeing with what the pastor says so they'll know if they can agree or not. And the reason is, is because they don't have a clue what the Word says. If you don't know the word of God, my friend, you're in trouble. How are you going to know when error comes into your church? Well, it looks good. Is that what we go on by what something looks like? It sounds good. Is that what we go by? 
We go by the inner witness. And if your spirit is not bearing witness with what's going on, there's a problem. And we have allowed things to come in. I got a call not long ago from a young lady who says, my mother wanted me to ask you a question. They have this new type of deliverance going on in their church. Well, I'm always interested in new deliverance. So I said, tell me about it. And she said, well, there's several pastors in this area, and they've band together, and they get these people in, and they pray over them, and, and the Holy Spirit just tells them all kinds of things. And so these people are receiving just all kinds of healing and stuff, and I thought, that's, that's good. And she said, but this strange thing happened. There was this family in my mother's church, and their son had been killed. And they were kind of struggling because they weren't sure whether he was, uh, you know, in a spiritual condition. And so they wanted this pastor to pray for him. And so his, the two people that he usually prayed with were gone. And so he finally, after their continual asking, relented and, and prayed for him. And right in the middle of his praying for them, they began to talk to their son. And she says, is, is, what's that? And I said, uh, I think you find that in the Bible. And she said, you do? And I said, yeah, it's called the Witch of Endor. You need to read it. That's familiar spirit talking. That's not Holy Spirit. These are pastors. Hello, where are we? We've got to be very careful and judge from the Bible, not by how something looks or how we think about it, but the inner witness. If the Holy Spirit says something's wrong, something's wrong. You need to begin to line it up with the Word. If it's not lining up with the Word, you need to say, whoa. I have lots of people talking about revival that goes on in their church and lots of manifestations. Well, we have lots of manifestations too. And they talk about manifestations such as snapping, growling, barking, those types of things. I want you to know that there have been very few nights of revival I've ever missed. Up until I started traveling so much a year and a half ago, I never missed a night. I have never heard anybody over there bark. And if, per chance, that would happen, they would not be over there. They would be over here. Because over here is where we work. Because, see, that, that is not God. That's usually when you hear growling, snapping, uh, those types of things, that's usually a perverse spirit that's at work. And you can bind that and it will stop. But people let things go because they don't know and they don't want to say. Well, if you're not going to say, who is? And if you just get that attitude of anything goes, anything will go. And I'm not saying that we have to be rigid and judge because that's certainly not what we do here. But there's got to be some discernment. Thank God my pastor has discernment. Enough to know. And thank God he has given that to us in deliverance so that we know because a lot of times when you go up to someone, you don't want to just begin binding something because it may be God working. You don't bind God. <laughs> so one of the rules that I use is if somebody is manifesting and you don't know whether it's good or bad, if you put your hand on them and you command the peace of God to go in, if that person calms down, then God is working. But if there is a stronghold that's gotten stirred up and the anointing is what brings all of this stuff to the surface, why do you think it comes to the surface? Because God is saying, this needs to be dealt with. And if it begins to get more wound up, then you know you need to bind it. And that's what we do here. We will bind everything. We don't do anything immediately until we, you know, get them through an interview. After about 
five or six months of dragging people over here and spending five or six hours beating your head to find out they had major unforgiveness for everybody they knew and you weren't getting anywhere, I learned this is not the way to do this. So we started just binding people up, giving them information, telling them how to get it through the process of deliverance, and it works much better. The only problem is, is we have many people that come here for deliverance and they're leaving in 15 minutes. And they don't have deliverance ministries in their church. And I'm telling you, you may think, I don't need a deliverance ministry in my church. Well, you may not today, but when revival breaks out, you will. <laughs> and besides, you've got plenty of people sitting on your pews that need help right now. I mean, I've been through that thing of counsel, 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 counsel. And telling them, you know, you're not renewing your mind enough, you're not in the word enough. And for some of them, that's true. But a lot of it is just strictly, they can't get past it. It's a stronghold that needs to be torn down. It's been there for a long time, generationally, and then they've worked on it. And it needs to be torn down. And what usually ends up happening is we have lost so many people because they just couldn't do the hypocrisy thing. They just couldn't come to church and then still do what they're doing. So they've just left and gone back out into the world. We lost them. So if you need to get a deliverance ministry started, you need to just go ahead and do it. You won't be sorry. It's a great ministry, great ministry. Where are we at, Robert? Oh, good. Well, now what are we going to talk about? <laughs> oh, I, okay. I know where I'm going. Isn't this great, just being led by the Spirit? Because <laughs> that's what it is today, folks. I'm telling you. I want to talk to you a little bit about a lying spirit. I'm going to try and get through this real quick. There are many manifestations there. I'm not going to read them all out. I'm going to talk about one in particular. It's called religious bondages. And I'm going to tell you what happened several years ago. I had a pastor that came in for deliverance. And this was an already defrocked pastor. He'd already gotten himself into some trouble. He'd lost his church, lost his wife, lost his kids, lost everything. And when he first came in for the interview type process, I thought, golly gee, um, he sure has been involved in all kinds of, I mean, junk. And bless God, he has absolutely zero remorse for any of this. I mean, it was just like. So we got him through that process, and we were going to start his deliverance, and we got started. Are you here to tell me I'm out of time? Okay, about three minutes, that's enough. We got started on this deliverance, and there was just nothing happening. And this guy was just kind of arrogant, and it was just kind of a, I kept thinking, what's his deal? What's he here for, you know? And we went on and on and on, and I had about eight sessions with this, with this gentleman. And we weren't getting anywhere. And finally, one night we were working, and I said, Lord, if you don't help me, I don't know what I'm going to do because I don't know where to go. I've been through this book three times. I know there's stuff there, but we're not getting a breakthrough. What's the deal? And he began to tell me what the deal was. He said, you need to address a false conversion. And I said, excuse me, I'm going to say to this pastor, you had a false conversion. I don't think so. And so I said, well, let me just kind of talk to him for a minute. So I said, when did you get saved? Now see, how many of you know when you got saved? Yeah, you know when you got saved. And so I kind of got this, well, I, you know, I was just at church, and his father was a pastor, so he'd grown up in church. And he said that, you know, just... Um, Sometime, uh, somebody said, when are, you, when are you going to go forward? When are you going to get saved? And he said, so I did. 
And I said, this, this guy grew into his salvation. He didn't accept salvation. See, the Bible talks about the Holy Spirit wooing you unto salvation. And all of a sudden, I knew that's what the Lord meant. That didn't happen. And so all this time, he was struggling with all kinds of things and yet trying to do the right thing, but he was walking right on the line with everything. And it finally caught up with him. You know, twisting the word, those types of things. As soon as I addressed the religious bondages and the false conversion, everything broke. I mean, the whole thing broke loose. And we were able to move on and move into the other areas and, and see that he got some freedom. And he turned around to me at one point and see as we begin to deal with things like a seared conscience, where his conscience had been so seared over, that's why he had no remorse for what he'd done. He didn't know what he'd done. He didn't realize what he'd done. But see, as we begin to deal with that, he began to break. And I knew when the reality of this started coming to him, he was going to break. And he did. And he turned around to me at one point and he said, you know, this is so amazing to me because I was very successful. And he said, and, and I heard from God. And the light bulb went on. And so I began to address the familiar spirit that was counterfeiting as the Holy Spirit. And that too broke. So, since we're out of time, I'm going to wind this up. This man was gloriously set free. I mean, just radically changed and was able to, to leave there and once again let the Holy Spirit draw him to a place where he could go to the altar. And I'm convinced now that all is well with him. But it was not well before. You will have to look for that because there are many people who have grown up in the church. They have done the right thing, said the right thing, seen the right thing. But it hasn't become a reality to them. If any of you people are interested in having us come and do a workshop, there's two gentlemen over here that have some cards if you want to pick them up. God bless you. Thank you so much for coming.